Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jennifer Williams, and I'm so glad to be here with you today. November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month, and today is actually World Pancreatic Cancer Day. Early detection saves lives. Today, we are here to share with you the signs and symptoms, the things you need to be aware of, and how we are reimagining cancer care here at CBMC. We are so honored to have with us today Dr. Russell Langen, Director of Surgical Oncology for RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer, Cancer Institute of New Jersey. So if you have a question for Dr. Langen, leave us a comment below and please help me welcome Dr. Russell Langen. Hello, Dr. Langen. Hey there, good afternoon. Thank you so much for arranging this. And uh, this call is falling on World uh, Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Day. So happy to be here uh, raising awareness, not only of the disease, but uh, you know, waging hope for the treatments that we currently have. Yes, and, and I know that you're so busy, but we appreciate you being here. So let's dive right in. Um, why don't you start a little bit by telling us about the work that you do here at CBMC? Happy to. So I'm the uh, Associate Chief Surgical Officer for the Healthcare Systems Integration and Quality I also am the director of cancer surgery for half of the healthcare system, RWJ Barnabas Health and the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And uh, here on our campus, Cooper Barnabas Medical Center, I'm the chief of surgical oncology. My practice more than anything else does focus on pancreas. It's the majority of uh, what I do. My partners and I um, are the highest volume pancreatic surgeons for the state of New Jersey and are very proud of the pancreatic program that we have put together. Not just surgery, but screening, surveillance, genetics, the entire um, you know, pathway. It's a, it's a lot of hats you wear. <laughs> We're all lucky to have you for sure. Thank so, you, thank you. Starting with that, what, what is the function of our pancreas? And then maybe go into a little bit about what pancreatic cancer is. Sure. So it, the, the pancreas is an organ that lives within the abdominal cavity, lives towards the back. It is almost on, on your spine. There are other organs that uh, uh, are on, on top of it. Mm -hmm. It has a uh, function really in, in two realms. The first would be to, to make uh, enzymes to help you digest food. And the other are to uh, make chemicals in the body to help you, you know, process uh, food. So mm -hmm. it produces insulin, for instance. Um, Pancreas cancer can really be broken up into two. When you hear the word pancreatic cancer, that's that's what we would call pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So that is really what people think about when they hear pancreatic cancer. And that accounts for about 90% of pancreatic cancers. And then the other 10% are made up of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So that is a cancer that forms within the pancreas, but it is not pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So in the colloquial term of pancreas cancer, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is different. They need to be separated. You know, I see a lot of patients in my office that come to me with the diagnosis of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And before we have a conversation, they feel like they have pancreas cancer and they are drastically different in their aggressiveness and, and treatments. So do you want to go into um, a little bit more about each of those cancers and what to look sure. out for? Um, in the United States, uh, right now, um, it's um, predicted that around 60,000, 60,000 Americans will develop a, a pancreatic cancer. Uh, the incidence has been uh, going up. It's actually also been going up in younger demographics. Traditionally, the average age for the development of pancreas cancer was 72. It's now down to 70. It doesn't seem like uh, much, but um, the average age is coming down. We're seeing people in their 40s and 50s develop um, traditional pancreatic adenocarcinoma, pancreatic cancers. Um, there are certain features, um, uh, risk factors, let's say, that, um, that I think should be focused on to try mm -hmm. to mitigate you know, the real risk of pancreatic cancer. Some of those are pancreatic cysts, so pancreatic cysts, unlike cysts in other parts of the body, uh, can be precancerous. Um, to say that in a different way, pancreatic cysts are the most common identifiable precursor to pancreatic cancer. 15% mm -hmm. of Americans have a pancreatic cyst. However, 15% of Americans are not getting a pancreas cancer. Mm -hmm. So there's a large you know, uh, risk uh, range. Mm -hmm. But if a pancreatic cyst is identified, there are international guidelines 
that really should be used for lifelong uh, surveillance, uh, in particular for what we call mucinous cysts of the pancreas. And then certain patients require not only surveillance with imaging or endoscopy, but at times also risk reduction pancreas surgery to remove a portion of the pancreas to reduce their risk for developing pancreatic cancer. Um, and we can get into uh, programs that we have here on this campus and, and the health system in a little bit. Um, the, the other factor for pancreatic cancer that should you know, be out there and people be aware of it are genetic mutations. People can be mm -hmm. born with certain familial genetic alterations that increase the risk for that patient developing pancreatic cancer. And those patients are, are also worthy of lifelong surveillance. And what that typically means is being involved with a program like ours where you get a yearly MRI of the pancreas as well as a blood test to check for um, what we call a biomarker for pancreatic cancer. And, and that is lifelong uh, surveillance uh, mm -hmm. as well. Outside of that, the other classic risk factors exist for pancreas. Um, it is slightly more common in males. Smoking increases uh, the risk, obesity, um, things of that nature. But really, you know, when you're talking about screening, surveillance, and trying to mitigate risk, in my opinion, um, genetics and pancreatic cysts would be the, the top two. And Pancreatic cancer is typically found in later stages. Why, why is this? And, you know, are there tests? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and it's, a, let's say it's a little bit of an unusual, mm -hmm. um, you know, stage migration for pancreas cancer as compared to other sites. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it's pretty simplistic in that the pancreas is an organ that um, is out of the way. Mm -hmm. from another a number of other things you, you can't feel it so um pancreas cancers as they start and grow um most often go without symptom okay if you talk about the right side of the pancreas um patients can present with jaundice where they get yellow and mm -hmm. that would be a pancreas tumor that's starting to block the flow of bile through the bile duct but on the left side, other than maybe some very nonspecific abdominal, you know, fullness or a little pain, they, they will just be no symptom, you know, associated with that uh, tumor. So due to those factors, these tumors can grow. And then when they get to a certain size, they certainly have an increased chance of spreading, which we call metastasis. Um, so many patients do present not only with a large tumor that may not be technically able to be removed in an operating room, mm -hmm. but also um, with already having that tumor spread to other sites in the body. So the, the pancreas is a, a tough, tough yeah, little body there. Tough. <laughs> in fact, um, it's a tough organ to image as well. Um, there yeah. are a number of different um, corporations that have uh, yearly body screening, you know, it's mm -hmm. part of uh, a company's, um, let's say, benefit package, and patients will get a yearly CAT scan. However, that CAT scan typically comes without intravenous contrast, and pancreas cancers can be missed. In it, fact, even with a general CAT scan that someone would get in the emergency room, um, even if they drank the contrast and got intravenous mm -hmm. contrast, pancreas cancers can still be kind of hidden. It, it, so it's a tough organ to image. We have certain CAT scan protocols we use in pancreas and MRI, et cetera, but general scans at times can um, miss a small pancreas cancer. And so like to go back to talking about the pancreatic cyst too. So how, how would we know if we were experiencing, you know, if we had this cyst on our pancreas? Yeah. As a, so pancreatic yeah. cysts are incidentally found. Uh, what okay. literature tells us is that in around 3% of CAT scans, let's say you have a car accident, you get a CAT scan. 3% of CAT scans will pick up a small pancreatic cyst, but 16 to 19% of MRIs will pick up a pancreatic cyst. You get an MRI for your spine or, mm -hmm. or something else. Um, let's say 16 to 90% of those will pick up a pancreatic cyst. So pancreatic cysts are identified typically, incidentally, when a patient's getting imaging for another mm -hmm. disease process. But once it's identified, it's exceedingly important that that patient um, get plugged in with some form of a pancreas program. Um, pancreatic cysts, uh, we're trying to raise awareness of the risk uh, within pancreatic cysts nationally and internationally. 
but a number of general practitioners, general gastroenterologists, general surgeons really don't know that risk. And many of these patients are not followed and then they come back years later with a pancreatic cancer. So I just encourage all patients um, to seek out formal pancreatic programs um, to have pancreatic cyst surveillance. So that's a perfect segue to go into. So if someone is diagnosed or a cyst is found, what treatment options um, you know, do, you, do you offer here, do we offer at the hospital? So here at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center, um, we have a very formal pancreatic cyst program, mm -hmm. similar to other institutions like Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins. However, our program was one of the first in the country to onboard an artificial intelligence software that embeds into the medical record. And this software uses a computational linguistic model to identify patients that have a pancreatic cyst, and then automatically we can reach out to them. Wow. So patients are contacted, as well as the physicians who ordered that scan are contacted by letter and by phone to say, you have been identified as possibly having a precancerous mm -hmm. cyst in the pancreas. Would you like you know, surveillance? Yeah. And, then, and then we can bring them into our program. Um, uh, and then really the, the program follows international guidelines for the appropriate surveillance. Most surveillance is done with an MRI. Um, mm -hmm. And at times patients do have to have what's called an endoscopic ultrasound. That's a fancy endoscopy okay. that um, has a ultrasound probe on the end of the scope. So the gastroenterologist, if trained in this, can look through the wall of the stomach and see the pancreas and see disease or see a cyst and sample it. Wow. And nowadays also, when we sample it, meaning we take some fluid out of the cyst, we check that fluid not only for certain traditional markers of risk, but also we could do a genetic analysis on the fluid to try to risk stratify higher risk cysts from lower risk cysts on genetic profiling. That, the, the technology there is like, wow. Yeah, no, and it, it continues wow. to um, grow and improve. And certainly I guarantee 10 years from now, the genetic tests for pancreatic cysts will be drastically different than they are today. A good friend of mine who is the chief of surgical oncology at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, Dr. Ajay Maker uh, is working on a panel for that as we speak. He presents on it nationally at our conferences uh, yearly. So no doubt in 10 years, we'll be able to look at cis fluid in a different way using next generation sequencing of the genetics of the cis fluid. That's incredible. And to get into, to get a little personal with you, what is your philosophy of care treating a patient? Um, yeah, that's a great question, right? <laughs> uh, that's the heart of it. You know, my philosophy yeah. of care really is that in oncology and probably all of medicine, right? If your heart is in the right place, you and the patient will do well, right? Like your heart just has to be in the right place. But specific to pancreas, um, you cannot lose hope as a doctor and, and you cannot ever strip someone of hope, right? So um, more so important, I think, in pancreas because once someone gets that diagnosis, just think about it, right? Like you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, there's a lot of life left. Yeah. You get a diagnosis of pancreas cancer. Most Americans feel that that is um, fatal, period. And many Americans don't even know their treatment options at all. They're like, oh, okay, that's it. Like, sign me up for hospice. So uh, allowing your patients or my patients to realize that there is hope, keep hope, and we have made um, strides in pancreas cancer, really in the last five years, you could say 10 years, but I'm telling you really in the last five years, um, survivals have doubled. And this has been published by the Harvard hospitals, the MGH uh, published doubling of survival time for patients that have a pancreas cancer that can be surgically removed in combination with modern chemotherapy and radiation. So, um, and that's just standard of care. Outside of that, nationally, we have robust clinical trial networks in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a number of clinical trials really focused on improving survival and outcomes of pancreas cancer. So don't lose hope. That's that's number one. We love that. That's that's a good message for in all right. of us. Right. <laughs> and um, 
you're a part of a very exciting project here happening at the hospital. Can you tell us a little bit about the new cancer center that's currently under construction? Absolutely. So this is, um, let's say, a long time coming. I've been here for six and a half years. It was one of the first things I started saying when I arrived from New York. Um, we will have a standalone comprehensive cancer center on campus here. Construction has started. There was a brown graking uh, a month ago. There is steel going up. Mm -hmm. uh, we are raising this cancer center. We're also raising a cancer hospital in New Brunswick to be a standalone cancer hospital through uh, our healthcare system in the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Um, and if you think about it, um, if you are a patient with cancer, one, you don't want to go into a hospital. So all cancer patients should be kept out of a hospital as long as you can and, and only use inpatient setting when you have to. But traditionally, uh, a lot of programs kind of filtered through a hospital, but in a modern way and focusing on really um, uh, the whole patient, meaning psychosocial aspects of cancer care, um, a cancer center outside of the hospital will do that a lot better than, in, than an inpatient setting. Um, also, once you have a facility to put all of your cancer teams together, so the surgical oncology team, the medical oncology team, the radiation oncology team, the gastroenterologist, the interventional radiologist, the geneticist, et cetera, mm -hmm. to actually be practicing literally together, right? Like sharing office space. I walk out of my office, someone can be like, oh, you know, what are your thoughts on this trial? You know, what should we do? Um, it just drastically improves quality of care immediately. Like, of course, we are an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. We have what we call multidisciplinary conferences that used to be called tumor boards. Yes, we have those. We do that every week, right? People come together, we talk about cases. But now if you think about it, it's almost just like brainstorming live time, you know, all the time. So I think the quality will go up because of that period, but also for a patient, the psychosocial aspects of treating someone holistically will be much better um, suited in a facility like a standalone cancer center than, you know, a fractured type cancer program. That's Worth wonderful. It. It's exciting. I know it's exciting for everyone around Absolutely here and true. it's going to be wonderful for our patients. And is there anything else you'd like to add today? Uh, I just want to say that I am exceedingly proud of the program we have here in New Jersey at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center, the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health. Um, we, my partners and I, in our program, our hearts are in this. Um, we are happy to um, take care, answer calls, questions, anytime, reach out to us. Like you could just email us, no problem. Um, and for, for pancreas cancer, we are making strides. I promise that. I'm a member of PanCan. I would encourage any pancreas cancer uh, patients or families to get involved with PANCAN, that is our national organization, Pancreas Cancer Action Network. Um, and let's just keep, you know, improving. Don't lose hope. That's Wait how hope. we're gonna, no, <laughs> never Wait lose hope. So if you do wanna have a question or if you wanna make an appointment with Dr. Langan, we're gonna put his phone number up at the bottom of the screen. It's 973-322-5195. Um, so we'll pin that for you. And Dr. Langan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Thank and um, we'll, we'll talk soon and, and bye everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.